So I'll officially ring the bell and start the Acrimurgery meeting. meeting. Welcome everybody, it's 12.04. Katie Miller, you have our invocation. Yes, isn't this shocking? It's wonderful. Well, I decided to step outside my comfort zone and uh, tackle this one little thing I've never done. And so I'll just share with you a little bit. Um, most mornings when I wake up, I have a song in my head. When the kids were little, it was silly cartoon songs, but now things have changed. And now it's usually a country music song. So I'm gonna take some words from a uh, Rascal Flat song of how they will remember you. So if you'll go think along with me and I promise I'm not gonna sing them, I'm just gonna say them out loud. So it goes, you're gonna leave a legacy no matter what you do. It's not a question of if they will, it's how they remember you. Did you stand or did you fall? Did you build a bridge or did you build a wall? Did you hide your love or give it all? What did you do? Did you make them laugh or make them cry? Did you quit or did you try? Live your dreams or let them die? What did you do? When it all comes down, it's not if, it's how they remember you. Please join me for a moment of reflection. Help us as Rotarians and humans to do good. Help us as Rotarians and humans to be honest and ethical in all of our dealings. Help us as Rotarians and humans to serve others and help us as Rotarians and humans to faithfully fulfill our obligations as neighbors to our community, our nation, and the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Cheryl. That you, you, you actually, Katie, you are, um, you're a natural, so I'm, we're going to be tapping you often for the invocation. And, Thank and you Cheryl, much, again, Justin. thanks. On, our, on my email earlier to this morning, I also was suggesting that I don't have a flag. So uh, you, I know you have a flag. So if you could raise that, I'll ask everyone to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, your God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Cheryl. I like the motion effects. That's great. And now the four-way test. The four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be Will beneficial be to all concerned? That's great. So our greeter today is David Hall. David, do you have some guests to greet? We do have some guests. So uh, first of all, we have uh, Christine Gassash. Uh, Christine, would you like to say hello? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm with CHC Addiction Services, and I um, am here um, because uh, our new CEO, Chris Richardson, um, connected us with the Rotary Group, and we're so happy to be here. I'm just a silent bystander, just listening in. Um, our clinical director is going to be speaking with you guys in a few minutes. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Welcome. Christine. Thank you. And then uh, Vivian and Jack Herrig have a special guest, Rick Herrig. Rick, would you like to say something? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Rick. Uh, I, yeah, I wanted to hear what uh, your program was today because I'm a recovery coach. I work in the addiction field, and uh, I always need educated. Wonderful. Welcome, Rick. And I think that is it, uh, Dr. Rob. I do not see any other guests. All right. Well, thank you, David. And uh, Tiffany, to our, to our speaker and our guests, one of the things that we do include in our meetings, since we've been meeting virtually this entire year, is uh, some moments where we get to hear from people other than uh, me. <laughs> so we do some icebreakers. So I, I will share, as many of you have, have already seen and, probably, and commented, and I appreciate the nice comments, I had the opportunity this last weekend to uh, be up in Vermont as my youngest daughter finally had her wedding that was kicked down the road a year ago. And it was wonderful, but it was very interesting to see what goes around comes around. And some of the young women there uh, had some fashion items that I would have 
made me think I was back in the 70s, uh, including mini skirts and uh, wire rim glasses. So I was inspired to say, uh, as, a, as a Rotarian, reflecting on your past, uh, you have two options. You can comment on a fashion um, time that was either right up your alley or you have regrettable photos that you'd like not to declare, or uh, your choice in music, as you may have been to a, conf a concert that now you'd really not volunteer that ordinarily, but you're thinking, yeah, why did I really like Boy George? I can't believe I went to a Boy George concert. Um, that's actually a true story. And anyhow, so we're gonna do uh, fashion regrets or musical you know, pluses or minuses. So uh, Chris Richardson, I, you're on my screen. I'm gonna start, start off with you. What, which, which category and what do you wanna share? Or you not, don't wanna share, but you're going to well, share because it's fair and all concerned. <laughs> yeah, no, I, man, I tell you, that's a tough one. I, I think back in the nineties, um, as I was in high school, I was pretty eclectic in my fashion. I was much of an introvert, I have to admit, but I don't have any regrets about it. I mean, I did, I was a Prince fan, um, still am. And I was a, I, I did, I stepped out and did something different. I remember watching a video that he was in and he had this jacket that it was a Levi's jacket and it was lined up in safety pins. It had safety pins all around the, you know, where it was sewn and on the back, he had a peace sign and, and, you know, laid out in safety pins. And so I said, maybe I'll do that. I says, so I had my sister who kind of like, she does fashion kind of stuff. She basically created a jacket just like the one Prince had in the video. And so I went to school with this jacket and all I could get are people saying, hey, can I get a safety pin? Can I get a safety pin? And, but for me, it was nice to have something different and unique uh, but I never wear that jacket again. So that's my story. I didn't have any regrets about it, but it was definitely stepping out. I think we ought to have that come out of your closet uh, for one of our meetings. <laughs> that, that would be a that would be a feature. That would draw people yeah. away, Chris. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. Thank you. John Marshall. I haven't talked to you for a while. John, it's good to see you. Uh, good to see what everybody. are you willing to share today? Boy, I, I don't know if I, I, you know, when you talked about things, uh, that you see now that you grew up with. Um, one thing I do see a lot is when people talk about vintage, it, now they say things from the nineties are vintage and I have to stop and think how long ago that really was. I mean, it was 20 years ago, but it doesn't feel vintage. I guess that means I'm getting older to where, you know, people start saying that and I take offense to it. Um, one thing like you're talking about things kind of coming back in style from my era everybody always wanted a, a cool starter coat uh, jacket that there was a pullover with your your favorite team or you know the hot team of the time and it, I've seen those start to come back a little bit more now so it, it's funny to think about that and like you said I think things do have a time frame for the most part what was once popular will be again someday all right thanks Christina Horick I haven't talked to you for a long time do you have any uh, any fashion that was that worked for you or that you're now thinking, man, what was I thinking? Um, having a lot that didn't work for me, some by choice from my mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thinking back to the bell bottoms and the mom jeans, and I obviously wore glasses. She had me in those huge glasses. And it's so funny because I look back and I'm like, what was that? But all of it is coming back around. Uh, my daughter wants to wear the side ponytails and they're getting back into the high tops. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to go back there. <laughs> so not by choice, but yes, it's coming back around. Uh, mm -hmm. That's fun. Tamara. Oh, hi, Jenny. Yeah. Hi. Yes, I'm talking about music. Yeah. And back in the Vietnam War era, I taught high school. Sunday school, we called it supper club at Thursday nights at St. Paul's Church. And I used the, uh, what was the in music as a discussion toward, and I always tried to find a Bible a comment that was complimentary to the music. Oh, that was creative. It was great, except I was then fired. <laughs> oh, no. 
Well, that sounds like a good story by itself, but I think I, I need to join you in a glass of wine to be able to share that right now. <laughs> T- Tamara, how about you? Well, you know, like everyone before me said, 90s fashion is coming back now, right? So I don't want to bash it, but on the music train, my friends and I have um, recently bonded over the fact that um, while we are all usually pretty bubbly people, preppy back in the day, we also had an emo music phase. So a lot of like the screaming, really dark, deep feeling, um, that is, I, I can sing the lyrics um, for half of those songs from the 90s and early 2000s. So that's still in style for me. Oh, that's pretty good. Bill, Bill Lowry. Boy, it's, it's fun to use my office computer. They finally let me in. So I actually see a much broader screen than I used to see on my iPad. There's a reason why I have very little hair right now. It's because I had a mullet until the seventh grade. Um, and not only that, I, I showed up to kindergarten with the longest rat tail. I don't know what my parents let me do that. I think it was a joke on my brother. And that thing got snipped on the, after the first day of kindergarten. So that's all I got. That's, so, so it was the mullet. I, maybe that's why I lost all my hair. That's, that's good to know. <laughs> we got her haircut. Lorraine, on your birthday, what, what do you reflect on and happy birthday? Oh, thank you. I agree with what I think what certain Christina said, the big glasses. My kids are like, mom, I cannot believe you wore those huge glasses. And I was a little bit chunkier then. So like my glasses were big, my cheeks were big, everything was big up here. Um, hair was big. So just things like that. I look back, my mom gave me a perm one time because I wanted to be, you know, had curly hair, except for it turned out like an Afro. Um, instead of nice curls like some of the other girls had. So just everything back in the day, everything big um, is what I what I remember. A little embarrassing, but we survived. <laughs> All right. Well, let's wrap it up with a comment by Jacinto. Sure. Well, I wouldn't call them parachute pants, but I call them parachute light pants. Um, that I wore that were really shimmery silver and it was a middle school and I thought it was really cool. It sounds like you were giving Elton John a a boost there. Yeah, maybe a little bit more like MC Hammer, but. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Uh, Well, thanks. Thanks everybody. So thanks for uh, getting the ice broken here. As we talk, um, are there any ambassadors? Anybody that's attended a Rotary event or another club uh, that they'd like to share and make sure that the Akron Rotary was represented and gets credit? Now I'm looking at, uh, Cheryl, you have your hand up. Um, I always have my hand up. I actually went to another district conference um, over the week, uh, Thursday and Friday for 6,500 in Detroit and represented our Akron club. So it was, it was different and fun. They did it more as a webinar, um, but it was well done. That's good. Anybody else? I saw a sign for a rotary in Vermont, but it, uh, it wasn't on our agenda. We had too many other things that we had to get done. So I, I had an opportunity, but I, I didn't step up. Uh, okay, well, I'm not seeing anybody else. So announcements. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the Paul Harris Fellows that received their, their uh, badges in this past uh, two weeks. I believe it was a pretty rainy day when Cheryl Warren was, was driving around and, and, gave, and found uh, Dane and myself, uh, but Dr. Doug, and John Margito also got their Paul Harris Fellows. So hopefully soon we'll be hearing some more information about Paul Harris Fellows so the rest of you can join us in our support of uh, Rotary International. On May 15th is an opportunity for the Clean Up the Camp. It's the last one of this season and there's always opportunities to be socially distanced and uh, do, do some work to prepare for our campers as it's rapidly approaching. Another thing that I would just like to announce is uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're looking towards what's the future of Rotary meetings 
and what's the combination of hybrid in person what are the meetings that what will they look like and we're trying to help uh, president elect buoy with his budget so we really have to do some things and when we did our our strategic planning process looking at engagement we had on our list as a, a very doable thing as a survey to say how do members want to be engaged and especially as we're in a transition period moving from all virtual to some form of in-person i think we're all looking forward to that and there are discussions within chaz's team as to what that might look like and cheryl warren is going to give us some information at the leadership conference along with some other rotarians about what are the variations of a theme we, we know that that having some hy hybrid has been great for getting speakers in it's been great to engage some former from uh, relatively older member more distant members uh, that have been here but but because of their work commitments um, especially early in their career they're now it's tough to get in because you got to drive in be there and then we all kind of hover a little bit afterwards so some employers don't necessarily like you having two hours off at lunchtime and so we've had some people that we haven't seen for a while come back i don't want to lose that but by the same token we need to know what kind of party to plan because we don't want to have a party that you won't come to so steve Bowie, along with carol Mar uh, martero becker and sandy aragon are leading up a team drafting a, a brief survey that looks at what will you be excited about as we move forward and how do we plan uh, the next iteration of Rotary Meeting. So please stay tuned and be on the lookout for that. Any other announcements? All right, who's happy? Ah, Grandpa Bowie's happy. Yeah, that blows my mind. That blows my mind to hear that. And yesterday, my wife and I uh became grandparents for the very first time and uh oh. there he is <laughs> that is uh that is calvin thomas Bowie. he was born at 9 54 in the morning yesterday and uh i'm still walking on air and so i have 11 uh happy dollars 10 for welcoming him into the world and then i have one other very special do uh, dollar and that's for our president and for um, the weekend that he had up in Vermont with his family and marrying off his youngest daughter. And Rob, I have to say that all those pictures that uh, you posted, you look really good all cleaned up. You look good. <laughs> that's why I've been withdrawn now. Now it's only sweatshirts, sweatshirts and jeans. You know, dress it up for three days in a row was kind of... Uh, it, it was fun, but thanks. And it, it was a ball. And you're going to continue to be on cloud nine with that, uh, with that little guy. I, I guarantee it. Craig, uh, did you, you said. No, Jack Herrick has his hand up. Okay, Jack. Well, I've got uh, 10 happy dollars. Five happy dollars for Steve's new rotary candidate. And uh, five happy dollars because our oldest son is with us today and we're proud of him and the work he's doing. Well, that's great. And we're glad you brought him along. I thought I saw a hand up earlier. Let me see. If you had your hand up, uh, Katie, go ahead. I have five happy dollars. We uh, made it safely home from her month in Florida in our tiny little home of up one, under 100 square feet. Um, drove through some hellacious weather Sunday, but we got here safe and sound. Um, another couple dollars for my, um, uh, we get to see our grandson for the first time in seven months on Friday. I get to babysit and I, I can't wait. I'm so excited. It's going to be a big family affair. And finally, I'm so excited to announce, and I've had to keep our mouths quiet for quite a while, that uh, our youngest daughter, Casey, um, has accepted a position with the NASCAR Foundation um, in Daytona Beach as a senior marketing specialist. And she will be fleeing, flying away from us on um, Memorial Day weekend. And we'll be going down there to help her move and get a car and things like that. But it's been like a two month interview process. And um, it's just really exciting that during this time that she gets to make this big giant, giant leap with such a really, really 
prominent foundation. So we're all good move. Yeah, that's wonderful. Congratulations. Chris Richardson, I saw your hand up. Yeah, so I have 20 happy dollars. Ten to uh, support my colleague, Tiffany, um, who's going to be presenting here momentarily. So excited to hear her present. And just thank you to my fellow Rotarians for creating a platform for CHC addiction to present. And then the other is, is um, the second of uh, our three children is graduating from Kent State Saturday. So very excited. She um, is getting her bachelor's in biochemistry, and then she'll be starting uh, grad school at Kent State, um, uh, going into their MPH program, Master's of Public Health. So thank you. Wow, that's exciting. A lot of good, good stuff there. Yeah. Anybody else happy? Oh, Connor Jarvis is happy. Yeah, uh, happy. Uh, uh, what was I going to say? Well, yeah, so 10 happy dollars. Uh, just a few things. Uh, one, of course, to congratulate Steve uh, and was so excited to, to hear that news and sharing that news. So congratulations, brother. A long time coming and uh, beautiful baby boy. Um, Dr. Rob as well. Just glad you had a great time in Vermont. I know you guys have been looking forward to that, too. Um, and uh, then another happy dollar. I'm, I'm fully vaxxed and, and not at all waxed. So I don't know if anyone's heard the, heard the vaccine waxing, but I'm fully vaxxed. I'm not waxed, but <laughs> I'm happy, uh, happy to have that behind me as well, too. So 10 happy dollars for those three things. Thank you, Connor. My new son-in-law's name is Connor. So uh, DJ. that's very, very appropriate. Oh, yeah, that's right. And the other, yeah, I remember that. So that's, uh, I'm Dr. Rob's Connor, right? That's, how that, that's right. You're, 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 you're Connor, Connor, my friend, and then there's <laughs> Connor that now is the son-in-law. Right. <laughs> and then there's Connor the dog across the creek, so. Oh, great. I'm glad that's not my nickname. <laughs> Okay, so I don't see any other happy dollars, but I'm sure there's other people happy, have, and I'll be I'll be officially Dr. happy. Rob, we have one uh, more Christine Horak, I think, what had some happy dollars. Oh, I'm sorry, Christine, I missed you. It's okay. I've got five happy dollars, um, kind of piggybacking Chris's graduation comment. My daughter is finally graduating preschool. We ended up holding her an extra year because of COVID last year to start kindergarten, so she did pre-K five, but very very excited. She's ready to to get started on her career in kindergarten next year. Oh, that's great. And uh, hopefully it'll be a whole lot more normal this year than it would have been last year. So that's fun. And I will make my official happy dollars next week when I have more photos that I can get in in time to Cheryl. I was processing them last night at midnight and I thought, yeah, I've got to get some sleep after an eight hour drive, but I'm very happy. So could we have the speaker slide, Cheryl? So I'm very happy to have Tiffany Ferguson with us. Certainly during this pandemic, drug addiction has been even more of a problem, if that's possible, than it was before. And she is here to share some of the CHC addiction services, where she serves as the clinical director. And I'm going to let Tiffany take it away. Well, thank you so much for having me today, and I appreciate your icebreakers and all of the gratitude that you guys are sharing. I did not speak, but I also participated in some of the 80s and 90s hair scrunchy side ponytail things um, back in the day, and now I have um, my daughter who thinks that that's a really cool thing to do, so um, I can relate to some of the things we were talking about. So I work here at CHC Addiction Services in Akron. And we have been around, we will be coming up on 50 years in the next couple of years here. And we used to be called the Community Drug Board many years ago. We're over on East Market Street and then the Community Health Center and now CHC Addiction Services to really let people know that we are here to help um, with any kind of addiction, behavioral health, mental health needs. So as was alluded to, uh, this past year, especially with the pandemic, there have been a lot of concerns and increases in substance use, alcohol use, um, mental health concerns about anxiety and depression. A lot of people have experienced a lot of grief, you know, grief of some normalcy, grief of, um, you know, maybe actually having a loved one pass, and just a lot of, um, you know, just grief of regular routine and life and things. 
So today I was hoping to mostly focus on the hope for recovery and treatment aspect of things, because I know we all know that um, you know, uh, substance use is a problem right now. So I am hoping to share about the treatment aspect of things, which is what we focus on uh, here at CHC. So about 85% of the people we work with have what we call co-occurring disorders, which is both substance use and some kind of mental health. So maybe depression or anxiety or trauma and substance use. And so the people that we serve have really been through a lot and this year is no exception. There's been a lot of increases in isolation and a decrease in social support, sober activities, routine that people are used to. And so with that, a lot of people have increased mental health symptoms and substance use and people that maybe have been even in a stable recovery or haven't had symptoms for a while, some people have relapsed. So <clears throat> there is hope for recovery and treatment though. And so at our agency and there, you know, other places too around in Summit County, we are always available to help with any of those issues. We have walk-in hours Monday through Friday and people are able to come in between eight and noon Monday through Friday or to call in for an appointment. And we even offer telehealth services. So I know that's a big thing that has changed a lot during the pandemic is a lot of services are now available over telehealth. So oftentimes um, what happens is people are not sure if they need treatment or want treatment and that is okay. A lot of times people aren't sure if they do have a problem or not, you know, when is drinking alcohol too much. So a lot of times the advice is if people are experiencing negative consequences from what they're doing, you know, maybe their work is suffering or their family relationships are suffering or their finances are suffering. Um, it is helpful to get an assessment where we can sit down and see what's going on in your life and see, do we think that there is a, you know, something that we could help with or not. Oftentimes people want to continue to, you know, drink or use substances when they first get an assessment or come in for treatment and that's okay because that's what's happening in the person's life and that is why we're here. So people don't necessarily have to have the desire to stop using to come into you know, healthcare for that. So if you think about, if you have a cold or a cough, what you would do first. So if you are like myself or most people, you might try to handle it at home or on your own or maybe do something over the counter, maybe rest a little bit more, kind of handle it in-house in your family. Then maybe if it would get worse, you might want to see your family physician. Then maybe if your cold or cough was so bad that you thought, oh my goodness, I can't breathe, you know, I'm having respiratory issues, you might go to the hospital. So just like with other healthcare diseases, you might try to manage it at home and then as the symptoms are worse in severity, get more intensive treatment. The same as the case for addiction or mental health treatment. Oftentimes people try to manage it on their own first in the comfort of their own home with their own families by themselves. And then as it gets, you know, maybe some more consequences or concerning, they might talk to a provider. And then if it becomes like threatening or there's an overdose or something, maybe they'll go up to the hospital. So <clears throat> what we do here and, and with addiction treatment is it kind of um, is similar to any other physical health care or behavioral health care. So we try to see, and what we do is we, we do um, kind of a comprehensive assessment and see what is happening with the person in different areas of their life. So if somebody wants to get treatment, we look at their physical health, you know, are there co-occurring medical concerns, like maybe diabetes or a need for withdrawal management, what used to be known as detox, you know, especially with alcohol or opiates or benzodiazepine, things like Xanax. There's certain medications that you would need to um, get some med medical supervision of. Um, we will talk to somebody about their mental health, about their motivation, what do they want for their life, um, you know, what's kind of going on with their, their family or their work. And then after kind of looking at all those aspects, we will make a treatment recommendation. And for um, things that are less severe, we might recommend, you know, counseling once a week. And for things that have more intensive symptoms, just like another physical health, you know, issue, 
we might recommend all the way up to a more intensive treatment, such as like a residential treatment or what people call rehab, um, you know, where somebody might stay. But we work with somebody and try to assess that and see what they want. And we also have um, a medical team that can get involved and help evaluate. We can do lab work. We have a lab on site and we have nursing. And so we kind of try to look at all those different pieces of somebody's um, life to make a decision and try to provide holistic wraparound care. You know, addiction and mental health issues impact the whole family, right? Everybody that that person loves, people around them, their colleagues, their friends. So we also try to provide holistic care and holistic treatment. So oftentimes after we do that kind of thorough assessment, people will be recommended for some kind of counseling. And in that we would work on, you know, specific goals to help them where they want to go. And then we also have um, an addiction medicine specialist. So addiction medicine is kind of a, maybe a newer or a lesser well-known medical specialty. So just like there's cardiologists or podiatrists or anything else, there's addiction medicine special, specialists that specialize in addiction treatment. And so certain um, substances that people use, they might also be recommended to see your addiction medicine specialist doctor. And then they might be recommended or decide um, when they have their physician appointment to go on one of three medications. So there's three medications um, that are really well known called medication assisted treatment for opiates, methadone, uh, buprenorphine and Vivitrol. And all of those can be very helpful for people and there's different kind of pros and cons and reasons why people go on them, but they're all known to be very, um, to help people with reducing and stopping their substance use and kind of re-engaging um, in other recovery activities. So oftentimes if somebody is put on medication, we like to say it is like one slice of the pie or one slice of the pizza. So with recovery and treatment as a whole pie or a whole pizza, uh, medication could be one aspect of that. And then all the other slices of the pie or pizza would be other things. Maybe counseling, maybe sober support, maybe going to 12-step meetings or engaging in you know, community activities or work or family life. Um, and so we try to be holistic about that. Um, <clears throat> some of the times people need medication because if they are used to using substances and they try to stop using them, they feel very physically ill and sick. And if you think about a day you feel really badly, like maybe if you have the flu um, or if you had a really bad reaction to a vaccine recently, that's probably not the day you're gonna go out and find a new doctor's appointment and go to the gym and you know go to job interviews. So just like people we work with, we want to get them physically stable and feeling better um, before we would have, you know, come alongside people to have them do these other things um, that they want to do with their life. So oftentimes we also offer psychiatry services to help people if, um, if they need more, you know, mental health care. And we do treat co-occurring, so that means both mental health and substance use together. And then what happens is if people need more intensive treatment, then they would get, um, something called IOP, which is um, nine hours or more a week of treatment, or partial hospitalization, which would be 20 hours or more of treatment, or sometimes even residential treatment. So again, it kind of goes least intensive to most intensive, or sometimes a referral to a local hospital. So there's kind of some specialty care too um, that we can offer, and that is important a lot of times for people in recovery. So there's gender-specific treatment, there's a special program for moms. One of the biggest concerns we often hear from women is what will happen to my children if I'm facing one of these issues? We might have concerns about, you know, um, will my children be impacted? Will children's services get involved with my children if they know I'm severely depressed or using substances? And so we work very hard, hard to come alongside moms, support them, and, um, we have a whole special mom's program with like a nurse practitioner. We help with everything from, you know, if they, people need help with infant massage or childcare, we offer childcare so moms can get treatment um, for, for counseling services. 
And um, so we try to provide uh, holistic care. Uh, one of the questions just came up, do we provide partial hospitalization services here? And the answer is yes. So all the services I've talked about so far, we provide here um, in Akron, Ohio, through CHC. We actually have five different sites and we have a partial hospitalization program where people can stay actually and bring up to two of their children. So we try to make sure that, in, you know, oftentimes if somebody is pregnant or postpartum or has little children, we want to continue that family relationship and try to disrupt, you know, maybe people being placed in foster care or other systems if they don't need to be. So oftentimes the moms will bring children and then wake up, eat breakfast together. The children will go to on-site childcare, you know, do educational things. And then they'll eat lunch together. The moms will go back to their counseling or group or psychiatry services. And then around three o'clock, they're all done together and can have dinner together and stay together and have a bedtime routine. And so most, most of the moms are able to, you know, stay with their children the whole time. Yeah, so we really try to break the cycle of addiction here. Um, you know, try to give the kids a safe, sober place to be while the moms can get healthy. It, and people don't have to have children to participate in that program, but, but if they do have children, they're able to bring children. And then we also have um, a men specific residential program too, where we um, work with men. We have some dads programming, fatherhood initiatives there, and other programs that we try to help. Um, sorry, I'm kind of, I might just read through some of the questions when I'm done because it's hard for me to read, read questions. Uh, and we don't actually expect you to a a answer those in real time. Dave Hall will summarize them because some of the questions overlap. So please don't be distracted by it. Okay. No, thank you. I, I want to be helpful and answer all of them. So I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> so in general, we, we kind of try to provide all of those services as part of treatment. And then something that was really interesting to me that I didn't realize until I worked here. Um, I originally planned to work here for two years and then now it's been about 17 years. I'm still here and I really love our mission and what we do. So it kind of stuck with me. But um, our, our, our former head addiction medicine doctor, he used to be an OBGYN. And he said a lot of times addiction treatment gets a bad rap because people sometimes have a stigma that it doesn't work or people relapse or don't recover. And so a lot of the research shows that actually the rates of symptom reoccurrence and the rates of relapse with addiction are the same as other diseases like high blood pressure or um, type two diabetes. So for example, if anyone here knows anybody that has ever been diagnosed with high blood pressure, you have symptoms that go along with that. And let's say you go to a relative's house on a holiday. And when you're there, you have another symptom recurrence or maybe even a relapse to high blood pressure, okay? So then you think, oh man, I'm not gonna go to that relative's house again. Or maybe next time I'll take a desert person with me to that relative's house. Or maybe I'm just gonna go to a different relative's house on the holiday. So you kind of learn to manage your symptoms or relapse the symptoms. So the same thing happens with substance use, right? People have to learn, even that if they experience relapse or symptom recurrence, how to manage their symptoms. Maybe they realize, oh, I can't be around those people again, or I need to avoid that situation, or I need to you know, do something differently and not go to this place, go to this place instead. And so that is all part of recovery. And so we, we don't want people to get discouraged because the relapse rate, like I said, and return to symptom rate for those things, uh, all diseases, addiction, um, high blood pressure, certain things are about the same. And that is part of the recovery process of people learning and growing um, in their recovery. So we want people to feel encouraged to continue with their recovery, not to hear things like, you know, treatment doesn't work or that didn't work, but hey, what can we learn? How can we continue? In your recovery, what can we do, you know, differently or what happened there to kind of help get you back on track? So with that in mind, 
Uh, we have other wraparound services that are helpful to people. And a lot of times one of those is having a peer recovery supporter. And I know there's one on our call today, which is great. So peer recovery supporters oftentimes come alongside of people and share their own lived experience and help identify maybe how to navigate systems or share about what worked for them, kind of encourage and support people in their own recovery. We have case managers that can help, again, people navigate systems or get resources for people, maybe find good, you know, sober support meetings or activities that people might want to connect with. And then we also have telehealth options available for people, which has been really helpful, especially during the pandemic. So people can stay in the privacy of their own home or car, talk to a counselor, you know, talk to a psychiatrist and, and get assistance with their issues in the privacy of their own home. So one of the good things is that we, we study some of our patient outcomes and about 88% of our patients that start on some kind of medication as part of their treatment are able to get on a stable dose of medication and stop using illicit opiates. And that is something that I really wish was more broadly known and published because I know there was a big article even yesterday about overdoses and substance use. And then there's also this hope, you know, the 88% of people that engage in treatment will stop using illicit substances and, and enter recovery. So that is important. Um, and I would like everybody to realize that that is a possibility and exists. So really we're here to help support people with goals, their recovery, reconnect, you know, with their life, their family, civic engagement, their communities, you know, parenting, their work. And we hope to do that by assisting them with their substance use and mental health. So that is a general overview, but I do realize I, there is, I think, many questions or comments people had that I would be happy to help with. Great. And then, Chris, I know Chris is on the call, and so it's Chrissy, if either one of them wanted to add or say anything, that would be good as well. Great, Tiffany. Thank you so much for the talk. That was very good. We do have some questions, and I'll kind of go through them for you. Um, and, I, and again, I, I touched on a couple things, but here, but uh, talking about telehealth options, um, I, I, I think you talked about it a little bit, but is that uh, something you use uh, quite a bit through through the uh, through your services? Yes, it is. Uh, we had used it a little bit prior to the COVID pandemic, and then during the pandemic, at certain times, like even when the levels were more purple we switched to mostly telehealth services. So we, we had telehealth services available to pretty much everybody that needed to access them. Mm -hmm. And now we kind of have a blend, so. Good. Very yeah. good, very good. Um, Dr. Rob was also asking about the, the, the partial hospitalization. Um, and you talked about that, it sounds wonderful. It's fantastic that you, you allow uh, them to bring the kids, which is a, a huge benefit, I'm sure. Um, but uh, do you partner with other medical systems? We do. We do. We're part of SUMA's first step program, which is if somebody goes to the emergency room through SUMA and they need a medication, they will get something a lot of times in the emergency department and then refer to us for ongoing care. So we have a lot of partner and community referrals. That's one of the big ones we partner with a lot of places. <laughs> okay. And he, he asked a, a, a bit of a rhetorical question, but but I'd be interested in your input or, or anybody uh, from from your your uh, your place of work there. Um, wh why can doctors easily prescribe opiates, but it requires special training to be able to give addiction treatment medications? You have any comments on that? It's an astute observation, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is the case. So we. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know with, yeah. with, with any, any you know, with, with uh, the opiate addiction rates rising, whether they are doing anything to, to do more training with, with regular doctors. I don't know if that's something you would know. Maybe Dr. Rob might even have input on that. But They are. They are. The state has provided a lot of funding for doctors to be able to get their data waivers to at least prescribe, um, you know, the, the treatment medications for up to a certain amount of patients. And then there's places like ours that are kind of federally certified that we have like an unlimited amount of patients we can treat, so. Very good. I'd just, I'd just like to add that I, that I think it's, 
it's I was being a little a little wise in in that comment, but it's very challenging to me to to see people come right out of residency and they can write scripts for anything. So I don't doubt that there's specific education I need to be better at giving buprenorphine uh, or or um, you know any of the other medications to modify. But I would think on the front end, if we had more education, when and how to give those meds to start with, we would have skipped a major step. So again, that's, that's me and my soapbox, but thank you for your discussion. Thanks, Dr. Robbie. That's a very good observation. Um, are you able to intervene if, if, if someone senses that they're in danger? And are, are you able to, second part to that, can you mandate care or is it all voluntary? There are um, outreach teams that people can work with. I know different communities have different things. We, we actually have peer recovery supporters we employ that can do outreach to people that are not yet clients with patients, if that is helpful. If, if it's something urgent, I mean, just to speak highly of some of our peer recovery staff, they've seen somebody overdose, um, you know, in the middle of the double strip and have jumped out and given them Narcan and gotten them connected to care. So I really appreciate sometimes there are some of the unsung heroes um, kind of doing outreach. So we are able to intervene. There's a process you have to go through. And I know there's some legislation that people are working on as far as mandated treatment. I would say it's really important if it is your loved one, just to try to be very supportive of them engaging in treatment as much as possible, but not um, enabling, which is really a tricky Fine. Very good. Um, what are some of the things that you do to, to help reduce the repeat patients? Sure. Well, one of the things is that we try to encourage people. We work a lot on relapse prevention and strengthening sober supports and natural supports and underlying mental health issues. And we kind of, you know, how to maybe see what are some of the underlying issues that led maybe or were part of the reason to turn to substance use in the first place and try to treat that. So we do a lot of trauma treatment. We do something called um, EMDR therapy, which can treat trauma and just really try to have it so people hopefully feel, you know, more peaceful when they're not using substances and physically stable, which oftentimes helps. And just uh, to add on to that, I guess, wh wh where do you find most of your patients coming from? Do you, do you uh, the referrals, are they just family members referring or what's your typical referral? Sure, you, you know, it's really all over. A lot of people come through various, you know, maybe other healthcare systems, sometimes through, you know, school, school systems, a concerned loved one or family member, sometimes children's services, um, or another, you know, doctor. We do work with the VA. I think that was one of the questions. We do. My next question, and, yes. <laughs> yeah, and we accept uh, Medicaid, Medicare, and and a lot of private insurance, um, many private and commercial insurances. But anybody who is a resident of Summit County is able to receive services regardless of their ability to pay, as we're a Summit County Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Board funded partner. So really, anybody in Summit County and our trainers able to access care if they need it. Very good. Um, do you have a, like a best approach to, to get someone help who does not think they, who do not think they need help that help? I mean, one of the best things is to have a very kind of straightforward conversation about how much you love and care and are concerned for them and then also see maybe how it's affecting them negatively or negative consequences. And if the person is angry or upset, it's hard not to take it personally, but just realize that that is part of the disease process. Substance use wants to protect itself. So it creates a lot of defenses and anger and kind of lying and things. And that's part of the disease. So just to not take it personally and stick with your love and care and concern for that person, but also, hey, I noticed this is affected. This is how it's impacting me for this situation. And to use that and help them with resources, driving the treatment as far as, you know, hey, I'll take you to the hospital, take you to treatment. 
kind of healthy, things that would be healthy for them. Very good. I think you just about covered everything in, in, in the chat. Are, are there any other questions from the, the group that they thought of that they were not able to get into the chat? Go ahead and unmute and speak up. While people are overcoming their, their shyness, I'm, I'm gonna give a couple of other uh, brief announcements and then we can return back. Tiffany, thank you so much for your, for your very informative talk and, and letting us know about some of those resources. Uh, if your schedule allows, usually we keep our mic open after one o'clock for about five or 10 minutes just to make sure that people could ask other questions. If you have the time, if you don't, I certainly understand it. We leave it open also so that we can have a little fellowship because because uh, it's been such a, a challenging year. Um, next week, uh, Howard Parr from the Akron Civic Theater is going to be joining us. And I also want to make a, an announcement that dues are due May 15th. So I said you can go to the camp and do a cleanup if you sign up. Uh, on your way there, you may want to drop your check in the mail so that you pay your dues before the late fee is, is due. So we will be uh, reaching out to members. We really appreciate we've got such a nice, diverse club, both in terms of, of age and gender and the uh, professions that we represent. We want to keep everybody actively engaged. And I don't want to have a deterrent that your late fee is going to put, put a, bur a barrier there. So let's try to get ahead of it. If your company pays your, your dues, uh, you may want to bug them. I did that this morning and found out my, <laughs> it's embarrassing that the president of Rotary didn't have his dues paid yet, but the, uh, it turns out it was stuck in uh, accounts receivable and uh, it got unstuck. So my, my check is in the mail, Cheryl. I'd like to wish happy birthday to uh, Lorraine and Tom Knauer, who are, are both on the call today. So happy birthday, uh, Rotarians. Uh, tomorrow, Mark Seward has a birthday. And then as we go further, before next week, Hugh Al Peter on the 14th and, Ke and Kevin Smith on the 18th. Our joint anniversaries, Nick George is 22 years a Rotarian th this week. David Smith, 34 years a Rotarian. And our very own uh, secretary, Terry Dalton, 15 years a Rotarian. So congratulations there. Dr. Rob, real quick. Um, yes. I spoke with Howard Parr from the Civic and he's promising a very interactive, um, lots of photographs, slideshow of all the renovations that have been done at the Civic that have not been shown to the public yet. So I'd really urge Ooh, you're going to get a sneak, sneak preview. Piece. Yeah, and it's going to be, right. he's a compelling speaker and it should be really fun. So I just wanted to put that little plug in. All right, thanks, Katie. Any other questions for our speaker? Uh, yes. What collaboration have you got with veterans organizations? Uh, the veterans have similar, but also very dissimilar uh, responses to their return and, and coming home. And some it takes many years to come home. Yes, absolutely. We, we do collaborate very well with the VA and oftentimes they will refer people to us and then we coordinate care and services with the VA so we, we oftentimes have people in our medication program or receive counseling. We do have quite a few um, people that we are able to serve. And so we, we have spe some specialized programming and training for some of our staff as well. I'm involved with a group called Warriors Journey Home. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'd like to have a chance to talk to you sometime in the near future about some of the things that we have found and some of the uh, interaction that we might have that would be beneficial to our veterans. Sure, absolutely. That'd be great, thank you. Okay, well, I don't know if Cheryl's able to get the bell up yet um, that we We'll end our regular meeting and then we will flip into the, the time afterwards. So again, uh, thanks again for your great uh, discussion, Tiffany. And if you have a few minutes uh, or you're interested, please uh, stay on the line. Uh, this officially uh, adjourns the meeting of the Akron Rotary for 
2021. Thank you so much for being here. Those of you who joined us who are not members but are curious and think it's a great way, if you have an hour over uh, any Tuesday at noon, please feel free to reach out and we'll be more than glad to sponsor you to come for a couple of more meetings. You guys that are part of CHC, you've got Chris already there. So he'll be glad to sponsor you anytime you want to take a look or if you want to think about joining us. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Jeff, I'll connect you with uh, Christine and Tiffany so that you can have a further conversation on that. I'll copy you both on an email so you have communication back and forth. That works for me, unmuted. Rick, we on for breakfast in the morning? We sure are. That's where you're supposed to say you're buying, right? <laughs> it happens. <laughs> that's that already. <laughs> Tiffany, that was very informative. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. So um, what age services do you give, Tiffany? Where, how, how, low, how low do you, uh, what's the youngest? You know, the youngest, you? we had this been doing 12 years old and up. And then one time we had a couple of 11 year olds that had um, pretty serious opiate addiction. So technically 11 and up. Yeah, it's sad we're seeing it lower and that lower. Was, wow. yeah. That was a question I had that I didn't ask. Uh, you know, when I'm quite a bit older and we still had some of my high school comrades that had alcohol addiction. That was the primary venue and we lost some of them uh, mm. because it became a lifetime carryover. Yeah, yeah. We have some people here that, you know, started using opiates in, you know, Vietnam, the Vietnam War or something, and they just continued. And it's really hard as far as lifespan and PTSD and yeah, it is. Well, thank you for your service. Privilege. Tiffany, Tiffany, what, uh, what types of programs and resources do you find for uh, family members of, of folks with addiction? Sure. Well, we always recommend, you know, obviously Al-Anon or things online, um, codependency books. It's a family disease that obviously impacts everybody that is around the person that's using. And we oftentimes, if somebody is in treatment, we'll try to do, you know, counseling with a significant other. We can, you know, even do couples counseling or family counseling or encourage the person to get their own support outside of a person if they're getting treatment and if not it's even you know it's still very important because it, it it's hard to you know see somebody you love you know, ha have that disease so. i'm i'm still shocked to hear you say 12 and 13 year olds mm -hmm. must be very removed because i would not have expected to hear that Yeah, it, you know, and it's a lot of times people that you maybe wouldn't stereotypically expect either, you know, it's been sometimes students who are doing well in school and using or honor students, you know, it's, so it really is a disease that doesn't discriminate. There's a fair amount of genetic predisposition so that we've had um, the unfortunate situation where even judicious use of a post-operative opiate created or unlocked an addiction that, that was there so that we've we've actually uh, there's a family that has a foundation related to that because their child had orthopedic surgery and became addicted and, and died of an overdose and you know they recognized the the medication was indicated it was short term but they were genetically predisposed so that's what when kids want to do some dabbling you just pray that they're not one that has that gene because mm -hmm. it seems like it's innocent adolescent activity, but it's not always.
And is it scientifically proven that it was it Adderall that kids used on their for their face or something for acne? No, that's Accutane. Accutane. So is that something that's scientifically proven to lead to addiction or something? I, I don't know that. Where you might I actually, heard that. <laughs> you actually may mean Adderall because that's, Adderall. that's okay. the attention deficit drug. That's it. That, okay. The kids will abuse because they feel like, and actually any of us, if we took Adderall, would focus a little bit better for tasks at hand. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know that that's a gateway drug. I don't know, Tiffany, is that something that you guys see? Well, you know, interestingly enough, you mentioned the genetics. So a lot of the younger people we have treated have had parents or family members that uh, also have had active addictions. You know, one of the biggest things we know that does lead to kind of this epigenesis, epigenesis of addiction is actually when people are using marijuana and they're pregnant, uh, that can kind of prime the, the fetus to have an opiate addiction. So, so I know there's a big push right now, which is kind of a off top offshoot from what we're talking about as far as medical marijuana, which is really just marijuana, the same marijuana with a referral card. But if people use that while they're pregnant, it puts their, their child at risk for developing an opiate use disorder or substance use disorder because mm -hmm. of the way it primes their uh, brain. So that's just a factor that they have done a lot of research on. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. How's everybody else doing? Is John Daly on? Yep. yep. Good to see you, John. Thank you. Good to be seen. <laughs> so, Laura, did you see that if, if anybody in the club has someone that they think would, would uh, provide interesting content for us, even if they're remote, even if they're far away, uh, we can take advantage of this time. And Kate, Katie Miller is the main person. She's taken that over from John Margita. Uh, and we have a team uh, that we haven't had to activate because we've got so, such a nice uh, a number of, of excellent speakers lined up. But uh, so Pat uh, O'Neill, Steve Bowie, myself, and I'm missing somebody, Tom Knauer along with Katie kind of drives that if we have a relative dearth of, of people step it up, but we haven't had that. So please, any, any team member, I think Chris actually suggested that we reach out uh, to Tiffany. So thank you, Chris, if you're still on. He has not. But hey, tell Sharon we said hello. We can see her behind you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's good. I just didn't want her to suddenly start changing clothes or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing we didn't mention today when Tiffany was talking is um, you could mention, and Laura, you could talk about Docs Who Rock and, and for people's recovery. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, like Tiffany alluded to, there are so many great resources in the community. It's just letting the community know what resources are available and where they can go when they're ready for help or when their loved one is, is open to help also. So, um, yeah, I, I, the docs who rock. So I've seen them play a couple of times. Um, I believe that they're all physicians over at hmm. part of either SUMA or general or now Cleveland clinic. Um, is that the group that you're thinking no, of? No, I, I wasn't. I said docs who rock. Do I remember that? But the, the, uh, okay. the recovery, the recovery program for the radio yeah. station. Yeah, so we have a, a program here at the summit. We have Rock and Recovery, which is on every every evening from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. And it's also available 24-7 online at uh, rockandrecovery.com. And it's probably the most important mission that the summit has. Um, it's something that I really, truly believe in, the power of music and the ability to heal and uh on many of the topics that Tiffany discussed today too, you know, not only recovery and addiction, but on grief and on trauma and mental health and all those things. Um, so yeah, please, if you're not familiar with rock and recovery, thank you, Terrence, uh, check it out online. It's rockandrecovery.com or tune into the summit any evening after 10 PM 
Um, we have it 21 hours a week on the air. And like I said, 24 seven online. And we're great partners with the Summit County ADM board, um, as well as many of the recovery uh, locations and agencies throughout the area. So it's, we need every single one of those groups. <laughs> so. Yeah, I actually wish the Knox and Rock would get back together again because I think that was really a great event when they had that. It was, it was really interesting listening to the other side of the physicians, you know, that really were into the band and stuff. So it was, it was, it was really great. I know Dr. Hermanowski was on, CSS yeah. had a band for a number of years with that. And it was really great to see that. You see, the other side of the doctors is uh, more than just the physician, right? It's, it's that other hobbies that they had. So. So I hear you all had a monsoon while I was uh, whining about being a little bit chilly in Vermont. We had three inches of rain in our rain gauge. Wow. It snowed at yeah. my house. Yeah, yeah it actually snowed. snowed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it just rained all day and, and just constant and not light, not just a nice little sprinkle. <gasps> Now, uh, the community of Clinton is pretty much underwater right now out towards Portage Lakes, Canal Fulton area. Um, all of the tributaries kind of dump into their backyard. And unfortunately, there's nowhere for the water to go down there. And so they're having a lot of problems down there right now. Oh, well, that's a shame. Yeah. yeah. We got in really late last night, so I didn't notice. And this morning I realized, well, it's a light greener. Well, a week's gone by, but... I live on Tinker's Creek. <laughs> it looks like rapids, like you could ride a kayak down there yeah. right now. And I thought, I wonder what that's about. And one of them, as I got back on my email this morning, some of my colleagues said, well, good for you. You missed the monsoon. Uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> well, and if you didn't see last week, they actually did kayak races on the Cuyahoga down in front of the yeah. Sheraton. Yeah. They yeah. have three different events planned this summer um, with like national kayak racers, like people who do this professionally are coming in and running the rapids on the Cuyahoga down throughout the, like through Cowgo Falls and Monroe Falls, that area there too. So if you ever do see kayakers out and about, it's pretty cool to go down and watch them. If you oh, have yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've had our district conference there a few times with that events going on and it is so cool to watch it it was really an added benefit to having our conference there um a couple of years in a row so and they're loving the rapids right now they said absolutely hey phil's driving careful there <laughs> phil Hi. the kids and i went on an awesome hike yesterday um uh, downstream from the gorge right so we got there off of uh Cuyahoga Heights Street, whatever, but it was really cool. But yeah, there were there were spots that I'm not used to seeing water. There were some trees that you didn't see the bottom of because uh, of rising uh, waters. Right. Well, it's it's good to see you. I, I I saw your baseball cap during the game. I thought I know you're you're excited that uh, baseball season's around, but uh... yeah. Um, it, you know, good thing is, you know, things are picking up, so I'm on the road a bit more, right? And so I just didn't want to be a distraction during that call, so I, I, I put the... It was so bad two days ago that the Ducks had waiters on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jack. <laughs> well, there, there was a poor duck that was trying to get out of the water, but my, uh, my puppy wasn't allowing him to, and I had to... Like she was trying to get away from the rapids and Peanut you know, kept like chasing her back in. I was like, let that duck be. It was just too rough for her. Well, good day all. We're going to check out. All right. Likewise. And thanks again, Tiffany. Thank you, yeah, Tiffany. Thank you, Tiffany. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. And thanks, Rick, for joining us.